So my name is uh, Raj Vedam and I am from Indian His History Awareness and Research and I will be the moderator for the session today on Vedic and Ancient Indian Chronology. So uh, very glad to have on the panel very distinguished people here. Let me start from my left. We have Professor Subhash Kak from Oklahoma State University. We have uh, Next to uh, Professor Narahari Achar, then we have got Professor Sashi Tiwari. Check. Sorry, doesn't seem to like your name. <laughs> so, um, so the problem of Indian chronology. I call it a problem, and why do I do that? Let me open out with some statements, and then we'll give five minutes for each panelist to discuss, and then we'll get started with the discussion itself. We know that the chronology of ancient India, which was mostly designed or concocted or discovered by the British, uh, relied on the synchrony of Sandrakutas with Chandragupta Maurya. That helped them a lot because there was no way they could figure out what are the Indian timelines in, re in relationship to the Greek timelines, the timelines they knew about. And so the fortitious phonetic uh, association of, of um, Sandra Kutus with Chandragupta Maurya that perhaps this is where uh, uh, we can do a sheet anchoring. The second major one was the date of Gautama Buddha. It is contentious to this day, but nevertheless, providing a date for uh, Gautama Buddha permitted them to do certain things. Then we know there were records of travelers, people like uh, Huen Sang, Fahian, um, uh, and a whole lot of others. Then we had a whole host of epigraphy from various temples and other places in India, but unless you understood what the Indian calendrical systems were referring to, you could not have an absolutism to the Western dating systems. So there's a lot of controversy about that even today, whether they got hold of all the Indian calendrical systems, the Shaka era and other things correctly, or whether there's controversy about that. Finally, the texts contain a whole lot of dates. Texts and manuscripts contain information about dates, either directly or indirectly through astronomical calendars. So obviously, the people who worked on the Indian chronology had a lot to deal with. And they were confronted, the British at least, who came in 1700s, people like um, uh, William Jones and others. They encountered Puranic accounts that started typically with the grandson of the Pandavas from the Kali Yuga time, which they determined somewhere around 3000 BCE and so on, going all the way down to Gupta kings. And they couldn't make much sense out of it because it doesn't reckon very well with their flood accounts and the biblical records and so on. So they took it upon themselves to correct the chronological distortions of the Indian calendar. A whole host of scholarly uh, efforts went towards trying to find out how they can cherry pick from the Puranic record and construct what they called was the consistent Indian record. And the synchrony helped them a lot to do that. So their response to the Puranic records was to discredit the Puranas, say that they were not reliable sources of history. That is a trend that has continued to the present day when historians don't consider anything from the Indian epics, from the Indian records or the Puranas as credible sources of Indian history. They just don't do that. So there we are. Today we are at a point where we are taught something about the chronology of ancient India, but we, the insiders, know that there is a lot more to the chronology of ancient India. So some of the things I hope we'll discuss today are the dates of the epics, the dates of texts like Upanishads, like Brahmanas, Samhitas, Vedas, and so on. Perhaps the dates of the various rishis, and perhaps the dates of events contained in all of these things. Today we, we have at our disposal a whole host of techniques like uh, climate change records, understanding precision and astronomical calendars and uh, genetic records and trying to construct uh, ancient chronology. So I would like to start the discussion today by requesting each of the distinguished panelists to present 
their view on Indian chronology in five minutes uh, uh, to start with. Each person, please take just five minutes. I will alert you when five minutes is done. And after that, we'll pick out some uh, issues for the panel and the distinguished panel can discuss that. So I'd first like to request Professor Sashi Tiwari to please talk to us about uh, her, her opinion on the chronology for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ved Rajam. Raj Ved. Raj. Ved should be first. Discuss Vedic chronology. So, uh, according to the chronological order, this uh, this word should be first. So, uh, uh, I am thankful you have given me first uh, chance. And uh, being a Sanskritist and Indologist, I think, uh, firstly, uh, we should talk about the status and the background of this problem. What is, why th this is a problem? And what is the background, why chronology, why chronology ha is yet to be decided? And what, what are the uh, uh, questions they are to solve? As we all know, there are so many questions related to Vedic people regarding civilization, history, religion, mythology, and also chronology. So, uh, Sanskritists and Indologists are uh, busy with uh, solving the problem of original land and time uh, period of Vedic people. And this uh, all began in perhaps uh, uh, 1786 when William Jones first stated at Calcutta that uh, Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, Celtic, Old Persian, all these are related languages and they are coming from the common source. So later people started talking it as a Indo-European family of languages. And uh, the whole of the 19th century was dedicated to the study of language and literature, especially of the Vedic literature. There were so many scholars, uh, about 200 years, as Grossman, Bloomfield, Max Muller, Weber, Gra Ge Ge Geldner, Oldenburg, Ludwig, Kegi, Hellebrandt. There are number of, uh, more than 50 persons are there in France, Germany, and England. They were sitting over in the libraries and were editing books were translating books, were interpreting books, were studying their mythology, their language, as Hillebrand has done work on its uh, mythology, MacDonald has done on mythology, Whitney has done in, on grammar, MacDonald has done on grammar. So side by side they were studying also and all this was done. Then uh, in uh, 1912, 1912 Almost we can say that this was the ending period of this, all these literary works and A. A. MacDonald and A. B. Keith has published two volumes of Vedic Index and perhaps this was the concluding pro, uh, uh, work. Later about uh, this period, uh, near by this period, 1907, as you were talking about, Bogusko inscription was excavated in east of Turkey and its dating was done in 14th century BC according to archaeology. And what is the description there? They are talking about two communities, Hittany and Mittany, and they are uh, keeping uh, the name of four Vedic gods, which are religion, uh, Rig Vedic gods, Indra, Mitra, Varun, Nasatya. Nasatya are Ashwino, two Ashwino. So these uh, deities are mentioned there. It means it was decided that at 14th century BC, the, that region people were aware of Vedic deities. So, okay. So, then uh, in 1920, as you all know, Harappan Mohan Jodhuro were excavated and now they, f they started uh, uh, saying this, that, oh, the, these were the, these were destroyed, these cities were destroyed by Aryan people who came from outside and uh, dating were done of Harappan period at 3000 BC on the basis of chronology. Later, when 
वैदिक लिटरेचर इट इज़ ए वास्ट लिटरेचर ऑफ हैविंग सो मैनी कैटेगरीज ऑफ वर्क्स इट्स डेटिंग हैज टू बी डिसाइडेड बट देयर इज नो लिटरेरी आर्कोलॉजिकल एविडेंस ओनली लिटरेरी एविडेंस इज देयर सो वन सिविलाइजेशन इज हैविंग आर्कोलॉजिकल एविडेंसिस वन इज हैविंग लिटरेरी एविडेंसिस एंड देयर आर अदर एविडेंसिस ऑल्सो पीपल आर ट्राइंग टू एज एस्ट्रोनॉमी जियोग्राफी जियोलॉजी एटसेट्रा एटसेट्रा बट ऑल आर हैविंग डिफरेंसिस इन देयर ओपिनियंस सो फ्रॉम टेन थाउजेंड बी सी टू टू थाउजेंड बी सी ऑल डेट्स ऑफ वैदिक लिटरेचर आर फिक्स बाई डिफरेंट एंगल्स सो दिस इज ए वेरी वेरी डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन टू सॉल्व एंड वाई दिस इज ए दिस वॉज जनरेटेड ड्यू टू वैदिक लिटरेचर आई थिंक देर आर थ्री मेन रीजन्स आई विल से ओनली इन पॉइंट्स वन इज दैट देर इज नो मैंशन ऑफ डेट इन दैली वैदिक लिटरेचर देर इज नो मैंशन ऑफ द ऑथर्स इन द वैदिक लिटरेचर ऑल सीयर्स आर सेंग दे हैव गॉट दिस नॉलेज फ्रॉम दैट वन फ्रॉम दैट ही हैज रिसीव फ्रॉम दैट वन सो ऑल आर दैट नॉलेज इज कमिंग इन ट्रेडिशन इन श्रुति परम्परा बट देर इज नो एविडेंस ऑफ डेटिंग और ईयर दे आर टॉकिंग सो मैनी टॉक्स आर देर अबाउट डेट्स ऑल मैथमेटिकल कैलकुलेशन अप टू वन टू करोड्स आर देयर बट संवत्सर इज देयर मैनी टाइप्स ऑफ संवत्सराज आर देयर बट नो संवत और डेट इज फिक्स देयर सो दिस इज ए वन प्रॉब्लम द सेकेंड इज एज वी जस्ट टॉकिंग इट इज द एंशंट हेरिटेज एंशंट लिटरेचर and unesco has declared rigveda as the heritage ancient heritage of the world world civilization so it is very difficult and thirdly where i will stop my uh, putting this problem the third is that traditionally ancient our tradition indian tradition say that uh, vedas are anadi aparushe ananta so they are साक्षात कृत धर्माणा ऋषिया बब्बू सो हैव दे हैव विटनेस द मंत्रास दे हैव नॉट क्रिएटेड द मंत्रास नॉलेज इज इटर्नल नॉलेज इज कमिंग फ्रॉम वन टू एन अदर एंड दैट इज फ्रॉम द वेरी बिगनिंग ऑफ द सिविलाइजेशन वेन देयर वॉज क्रिएशन वेदास वर देयर दैट इज ब्रह्म विद्या वेद विद्या सो ऑल दीज थिंग्स आर देयर एंड अवर दर्शन आर नॉट पुटिंग एनी लाइट ऑन दिस प्रॉब्लम दे आर सेंग दैट लेट इट डोंट डिस्कस दीज थिंग बट डिस्कस what is written inside it that is most important that is to be followed by the persons for the upliftment or the, their life so that topic they they are not discussing i think so and there are other reasons also so i will finish here my this first opinion uh, giving here tiwari uh, request next uh, Neelish Nilakan Tok please uh, give us your wisdom in 5 minutes like this okay namaskar uh, so since the topic is vedic chronology i will not discuss why vedic chronology is important we will assume that it has a big strategic importance and uh, just continue from there so i was uh, happily selling um, researching in polymers polymer characterization and selling plastics and then i ran into arundhati and that's how i am sitting here in front of you uh, so for a long time uh, when i was researching and i'm researching for 20 years now i consider myself i will just uh, stick myself to mahabharat but then once i uh, did my work on mahabharat then many people started asking me and of course i was doing on my own so got into ramayan and frankly my uh, foray into rugveda is as recent as january 2017 when somebody approached me from the saraswati conference and so that's 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 the whole thing now um the rajvedam ji mentioned uh, different events for example buddha and then maurya and guptas and then you go backwards uh, uh, mahabharat ramayan and rugveda uh, so we all have many have different claims made for each of these each of this category and i think uh, from my point of view i would say uh, something that we all can agree to i mean the panelists but everyone in the audience is i say there are multiple claims but you know that when any time there are multiple claims we can all agree to this which is uh, either all the claims are false or 
one of them is true and once we make that everyone agrees with that i mean no disagreement so once we make that claim and if it's a historical if we consider it history then there is a time then definitely it has a chronology we may be successful in finding it we may not be successful in finding it but definitely there is a chronology if we consider that as a historical event now uh, in terms of uh, once we once we agree to these two statements then the question comes what method we can use or what method we should use to answer those two questions how do we test all the claims to see if all of them are false or how do we test it to see one of them is true and how do we go about doing it fortunately we have um, a science scientific method as our tool it is reductionist in nature which means unless the evidence exists it cannot do much uh, so we should go with whatever is available and not talk about whatever is not available and that works very successfully and so that's so again i'll repeat uh, that all the claims are either false or only one of them is true if we agree to that then we can start talking about not so much start jumping into the claims and discussing them but maybe agree on and not i don't mean agree just the panel here but as all indologists and what not everyone who is concerned with it agree on the method or a strategy going forward and if we don't do that i see the risk is uh, the loser is uh, the narrative for our civilization so that's the loss thank you ji i now request professor subhash kak to speak for 5 minutes uh, well uh, uh, chronology is something that i worked on for many years uh, and um, what happened was that uh, i am a historian of science apart from other things and i was looking into history of indian science and there are many questions that arise first of all what is it and when was something done and uh, it required going into different layers of literature and one question that comes up is was there an astronomy right and there were certain theories that maybe indian astronomy came from mesopotamia and so on but to cut a long story short it so happens that there was an astronomical basis to the great uh, vedic ritual like the agni chayan ritual and now that's very important and this wasn't this had this knowledge that there was an astronomical basis had sort of been lost and why is it important because this means that the astronomical references in the vedic literature ought to be taken seriously that is the most important point uh, most important take away from it just to give you an example uh, the one important argument in favor of the claim that astronomy came to india from the west namely babylonia was that the babylonians in the 7th century bc picked 360 as the number of divisions of the circle which is why you have 3 360 days of the year but 360 and 720 occur in the rigveda itself that this is you know even the most conservative uh, dating of the rigveda doesn't take it lower than about 1200 bc so the claim that astronomy came to india from babylonia is certainly false and there are, there are many many other reasons which i'll not go into but just to build upon it the astronomical references in the vedic literature and by here i mean the sanghitas the brahmanas the aranyakas the upanishads and the sutras definitely point to many events and these events are um you know eclipses or uh, solstice uh, associated with a certain uh, nakshatra and so on and there are events which are 13th century bc as in vedanga jyotish there is uh, dates 
which refer to 18th century BC or about 2000 BC as in the Shatapata Brahman. And so we have a consistent set of dates which move as the lit because we know that the literature is in different layers. So we have events in the Vedic literature and this goes back to 1893, the very, very famous book by Bal Gangadhar Tilak called the Orion, where he argued that the myth of um, Prajapati's head being chopped off was an astronomical myth related to the shifting of the year because the seasons shift due to precession of the earth. So there's a shift of one nakshatra every thousand years. And all of this literature that we have in India shows that shift correspondingly. So we do have definite evidence right now that there was some literature which is to be dated um, around the third millennium BC. There, there are a lot of other texts which go to the second millennium BC and later on all the way to the period of the Siddhantas. This apart, when the Greeks came to India, uh, they wrote up Indian histories and Aryan was one of those Greek historians. He said, Indians have a tradition where they count their kings for 4,000 certain number of years. I forget the exact count. Now it's very interesting of the various eras that we have in India. We've already heard about the Shaka Samved, the Vikrami, the Kali Yuga, which is 3102 BC. There is another one. Uh, in Kashmir, which is the Saptarshi Samvat, which is 3076 BC. And what the Greeks talk about is something which is exactly 3600 years longer than the Saptarshi Samvat, which will go, which will take it to 6676 BC. It's exactly that. So that we did have a tradition. We have the lists of king lists in the Puranas, uh, where Rama is the 30th generation, um, Krishna and the, and the war, the Mahabharata war is about the 98th generation or something in those lists. And I have them in my book, uh, The Astronomical Code. Then you also have the lists of the rishis, for example, in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. You have 60 or 80. Now, clearly, unlike kings, where a father uh, presumably is succeeded by the son or on an average the reign is about 20 years. That is what uh, has been uh, observed by looking at um, king lists over different parts of the world. But while the rishis it's much longer. Now if you have a rishi list which is 50 or 60 long clearly that's going to be at least a thousand years. If the Brihad Aranik Upanishad is 800 BC, it already takes you back to 2000 BC. So we have a lot of evidence and I will not agree with Nilesh that you have so many hypotheses and one of them has got to be correct. Why? Because all of them could be wrong. So if you have a certain number of hypotheses on the table, you, it's not, it doesn't follow that one of them has got to be definitely right. And what you do in science, you look at probability of evidence. You have many different hypotheses. You want independent corroboration. And you can't talk about things which are not connected to any other piece of evidence. And this rough thing, and of course I could wax on it for a long time because you know I have a lot of stuff which I've worked, uh, written up on it. And it's, it's a part of the encyclopedias. I have papers which, which the Royal Astronomical Society and other journals have published. And so it has been peer reviewed, which is totally consistent with the standard Indian tradition itself. Now it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there is no dispute. We must acknowledge it, that there is dispute. There are contradictions in the tradition related to when the Mahabharata war took place. The Puranas give you a certain number. The Raj Tarangani gives you another number. They, they later on in the 6th century AD, um, you have the Aihole inscription which says 3102 BC was when the Mahabharata war took place. Or you have Aryabhata who also ascribes to it 3102 BC. But that's much later. So you have contradictions. So clearly there were interruptions. But on the other hand, there was a general understanding that this tradition went many thousand years earlier and then we have a whole host of new evidence partly genetic 
uh, archaeological which hopefully we'll be able to discuss thank you professor kark now uh, you mentioned one of the panelists and so i guess the rules of the game uh, ask me to ask him for to address those comments but i am going to request nilesh ji to wait till i also offer professor uh, narahari to uh, shoes so so please thank you no not at not at this time <laughs> uh, uh yes uh in fact uh, the foundation has been laid on by professor tiwari and um, oak and kak uh the history or events we talk about events an event takes place at a place and at a time so if an event took place it has history so we agree that vedas exist and therefore they have a place and a time what we don't know is we don't know exactly where but we have a tradition to say that what we don't know is that how to map that time into the calendar that we use with the julian calendar or the british calendar otherwise we know exactly when things happen this is our tradition now now in the vedic tradition they say i talked about in what sense rigveda is anadi and ananta it's simply based on uh, the relationship with soma yajna and how the number of suktas in mandala 1 is the same as the number of suktas in mandala 10 and how this is related to prayana yashti and udayana yashti in soma yajna the beginning yashti is the same as the ending yashti and therefore there is no beginning and no end this statement is made in aitreya brahmana so the number of suktas in mandala 1 and mandala 10 are the same therefore the rigveda is a mandala it's like a shakala serpent so in that sense it is anadi and ananta it does not mean i mean in fact in rigveda itself in every mandala there is a statement that they, there are older rishis newer rishis and so on in um, first mandala uh, it says agni purve bhi rushi bhi ridyo nuta nairuta agni has been praised by older rishis and newer this is the first sukta so it's talking about older rishis so there were older rishis and there were newer rishis the chronology of rigveda is essentially the chronology of the rishis i don't subscribe to the idea that mandalas uh, the family mandalas were compiled first and then the other mandalas were added later and so on that doesn't agree with it because the for the performance of the soma yajna we need all the mandalas therefore whenever it was come whatever time it was compiled then all the suktas were already there at that time and our tradition says that it was compiled by vedavyasa at one time so i am a traditionalist so i subscribe to that but that doesn't mean that it is uh, simple blind trust or superstition now the chronology can be decided by either following the vamshavali as he has suggested how it is transmitted from guru to shishya parampara or you can also uh, look at the, uh, the chronology by looking at the transitions of the uh, equinoxes from nakshatra to nakshatra as mentioned by kar and uh, uh i have done some work on that and it goes back to tilak i'm going to mention that tilak's uh, work and how that can be uh, improved a little bit and then the question of mahabharata war comes in mahabharata date of mahabharata war is the uh called uh, uh the standard for fixing the date if you fix the date of mahabharata war it fixes the date before and after that and of course there is a controversy on that and so we'll be addressing that to some extent again this is based on the astronomical methods therefore we need to agree to as to how we decide the reliability of the data that we have on astronomy if you look at the 200 data or 200 uh, uh, pieces of information from uh, mahabharata 
you find lot of inconsistencies and controversies how do you reconcile which do you take as important which do you take as not so important and uh, put it aside and so we need to decide on that and my feeling is that there is a method and uh, one can decide the day based on what i consider to be the most important uh, pieces of information and then i can explain all the others in relation to those using various uh, techniques so it fixes the date at 3067 supposed to 5561 and then once you fix that then the date of uh, rigveda i show that it's based on uh, tilak goes to back about 7100 bc and there are various nakshatras that takes it continuously from all the way from 7100 to 2200 bc what we need to know matches uh, the dates of uh, parikshit janamejaya then all the way to gautam buddha then to shankaracharya and to kalidasa and then we are in the region of history as we know so okay so that's thank you check okay this is working uh that's fine you can keep it there again so we heard an excellent set of opening arguments from all our panelists and uh, we 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 have learned that uh there are several mechanisms that we can use to uh, date whether it is list uh, list of kings or with the astronomical clock and right now uh, professor kak as well as professor achar both alluded to the problem in dating of mahabharata especially and reference nilakan uh, nilakan nilesh oak's work and uh, the the issue here is that there is one cluster of dates around 3000 bce and uh, nilesh proposes a date of 5561 bce so i will now ask nilesh to address that because he has uh, been named in the panel so please go ahead and address the uh, remarks uh, all right so i'll start with uh, responding to a couple of things uh, professor kak mentioned he said he disagrees with me as to that uh, you know it doesn't have to be only one of the claim is right and so let's uh, just as a simple example uh, i'll take uh, what year for example we are trying to figure it out we know the answer exact answer uh, say what year uh, we heard uh, lokmanya tilak lokmanya tilak was born and let's say we did not have any records i mean easily available <laughs> records so the question is if lokmanya tilak is a real personality and there were not many multiple lokmanya tilak then the and he we, we agree that he was there then definitely he had one birth date or a birth year now whether we will able to determine it we don't know there could be multiple claims and what i'm saying is that they all could be wrong or one of them could be right but there will never be a situation that there are multiple years proposed by people using different methods and they all are right and that would apply also to historical events such as mahabharat ramayan uh, and so on or buddha and what not as long as we are assuming it is the one person and not one event or one person so that's just the first one in terms of people using multiple things multiple evidences rajatarangini or uh, genealogy data and so on uh, in fact we should be open to all available evidence okay i mean the beggars cannot be choosy so if we have a evidence we should use it and uh, that's exactly many people have done including myself what i would say is if we are deciding the date of mahabharat war the mahabharat text will be or should be the primary text that does not exclude the usage of other text but if it is about mahabharat it is the mahabharat text that should be the primary text if it is the ramayan it is the valmiki ramayan that is the primary text if we are talking about rugveda it is the rugveda Uh, understood that it is a shakal samhita that's all we have so again i went go back to whatever the evidence we have available just recently for example what happened there was a discourse going on in social media and somebody came and said uh, there are ma- bigger mahabharatas or there were bigger mahabharatas more than 100000 verses and you know that could be very well be true 
we, are, we don't have to go into denying that. But unless we find that manuscript, we have to stick with what we have. And we should be willing to change, all of us, willing to change whatever we claim and however we are convinced about it in the light of additional evidence. Check. So, so Nilesh, thank you for that response. Uh, I don't think in this panel we can conclusively come to one or the other, but it will be good to put the issues on the table. And one particular thing that often comes as a frequently asked question is the date of Kali Yuga. Because if Kali Yuga is as understood by Surya Siddhanta, a clustering of all the planets and sun and moon in the Revati Nakshatra, that comes out to be approximately February 18th, 3102 BCE, am I right? 3102 BCE, it comes out to that date. And traditionally, if we, accept, if we accept this as a date of Kali Yuga, we also know that's a date Bhagavan Krishna left uh, Earth, which means Mahabharata is in that vicinity. So this question comes up often. So I'd like to address the dates of Mahabharata in relation to Kali Yuga. Is the date of Kali Yuga as uh, discussed in uh, uh, popularly to be accepted or is there something more to it? So I'd like to open that with uh, Professor Kak about uh, the date of Kali Yuga. Well, uh, there are historians of astronomy who have, like, who have worked on it like Billard, this is a French guy. He wrote a book. Um, uh, in fact, uh, what had happened was that uh, in the field of astronomy or history of astronomy, there was Billard who was more sympathetic to the Indian dates. He went back to the various tables that we have from the Siddhantas and he argued that it showed that those tables were constructed by observations around the time where the supposed um, um, astronomer lived. For example, for Aryabhata, he argued that all those tables were appropriate for about uh, 510. So he says, of course, uh, for, he was, he was uh, what, 27 uh, in 3600 BC, but uh, 3600 uh, Kali Yuga, but really he was, he was, he was, it was not 23 years old when he did the observations, he was probably 33. He was only trying to show, uh, if, give a date which was a well round, round figure related to the start of the Kali Yuga era. Okay, but on the other hand, you had many other people who said, no, you know, this isn't, this isn't quite right and so on. Uh, uh, whether those dates were truly observed at that time, uh, there is a lot of dispute among historians of astronomy. Now, I have not personally, to be honest, examined those old uh, charts myself, so I cannot address them and tell you as to what I think. All I can say is that um, I think even Billard and many others thought that uh, the dating of the beginning of Kali Yuga was not actually at that time. It was not an event which had been observed. I think I'll just uh, stop there, yeah. Okay. Would you like to add to that? Yeah. Uh, it has gone down. <laughs> uh, now, Kali Yuga uh, there is a reference to that in Mahabharata, actually three or four references. Antarechaiva samprapte kalidvapara yo rabhut, syamanta panchake yuddham kuru pandava sene yoho. So the war between the kurus and the pandavas happened during the sandhi between kali and dvapara. Now that is the basis for relating Mahabharata war to kali yuga. Mahabharata itself never says when the kali yuga started, or when Dwapara ended. There are some indications that the Dwa Kali Yuga might have already started when the war was taking place. But the common belief is that the war happened or the Kali Yuga started after the war. Now the relationship between Bhagavata and the Kali Yuga that uh, it started when the Krishna departed from this uh, earth that is taken as the beginning of Kali Yuga. 
but this is a bhagavata type relationship and there is an explanation for that if the kali yuga had already started and you st- how can you still consider kali yuga starting after krishna departed 36 years after the war if the kali yuga had already started be- before the war then how can you account for this there is an explanation for in vishnu purana it says that even though kali yuga had already started as long as the lotus feet of the lord was on this earth kali did not have influence on this earth so we can think of that his influence starting on the departure of yoga so we can separate the beginning of kali yuga at 3102 bc or whatever with the mahabharata text it may be somewhere there there is a uh, leave a uh, for about 100 to 200 that's one uh number two i look at me if you ask me what is my date of birth i have to give three dates of birth what do you mean by that i'm only one person how can there be three dates because the date of birth we do not record is the date of birth in my family record it is i was born on a certain tithi in a certain masa in a certain year that is recorded <coughs> and corresponding to that there is a day in the christian calendar when i was admitted to uh, the primary school somebody took me there and they gave a date there unknown to me whatever that was that was one day there and then i realized that that date was not the same when i graduated from high school sslc but that time it was sealed so now which do i celebrate a date and my sslc certificate or the date which was recorded the christian date which was recorded in my family or the tithi and nakshatra usually tra- tra- tradition is to celebrate it on the tithi and nakshatra which varies from day to day so i have three dates of birth so it is possible to have dates of birth like that but that doesn't matter i'm still alive and it's there there's an event it has happened So that, that leads to a question that I have for uh, Professor uh, Tiwari. So it looks like, I, I think it's temperamental. It's just temperamental. So, yeah. let, let me try again. I, I think it's Check. This is okay. So, uh, there have been uh, several issues with regard to the date of kali yuga some say there's an inscription in the temples in badami that uh, reference kali yuga aryabhata himself refers to his age with respect to kali yuga uh, surya siddhanta talks about kali yuga so professor tiwari i'd like to hear from you if there are anything else you can say from the sources that you are familiar with about kali yuga uh, as professor narhari has said this is a common belief that shri krishna was in dwapara and when he left this earth kali yuga started secondly ram was in treta yuga and vedas were in satyu but in atre brahman there is a mantra kali shyano bhavati sanharati dwapara utishtha treta bhavati and fourth i am not remembering if charay vaiti so they are uh, still they in brahmanas brahman granthas and atre brahman is the Uh, quite uh, later uh, because we can according to me being a student of sanskrit we can only decide which is earlier which is later this is uh, regarding Mar- mahabharat ramayan vedic text upanishads uh, everywhere the same this is the only criteria we have this is the li- uh, early this is later because they have references they have not references so uh, i just want to say in this regard ki there is in uh, atre brahman there are four yugas and through that we can get this impression also that these yugas are not exactly representing or talking about the date they are representing some symbolic conception also they are talking kalishyanu bhavati sanharati dwapara utishta streta bhavati charat shat sat yuga always walks and it is just like getting up and it is sitting uh, second is sitting and the f- uh, fourth is sleeping all the time so and uh, as uh, shri bhagavat purana also we have a whole chapter 
where Kalyug is described and surprisingly, I was very much surprised every description of Kalyug was exactly going true with present scenario. They uh, all will be, uh, Varanas will be grumbled, marriages will be done by th their own. All these things are written there. So, so uh, I, I, I am always say Sanskrit literature is so glorious, so deep. There are so many things we have to understand, yet we are only trying to learn from something from that. Thank you, Professor Tiwari. So I'd like to address uh, Neelish Neelakantok next. So the Kali Yuga is, in the popular thinking, it is very closely related to the Mahabharata war. And there appears to be some kind of a consensus that what we call as Kali Yuga is around 3102 BCE. How do you reconcile this with your date of 5561 BCE? Thank you. So uh, Professor Achar actually mentioned that as far as the internal evidence of uh, the Mahabharata text is concerned. There is nothing that you can take from it. Uh, and if he doesn't agree, then I'll say it is my assertion that there is nothing from the Mahabharata text, any evidence that you can take and connect it to 3102 BCE for the starting of the Kali Yuga. So 3102 BCE is a well-established in a sense of a tradition. The tra uh, and so we can accept it, we can honor it. But as far as the connecting with Mahabharata, there is nothing inside Mahabharata. Now, uh, coming back to the Kali Yuga quickly, um, there are many researchers, right, beginning with uh, Lokman Nyatra, Bashankar Balakrishna Dikshit, and there are many others who have given different dates for, for Kali Yuga, uh, for ka beginning of Kali Yuga. For example, uh, Lokman Nyatra, he, he wrote eight uh, editorials in 1905 in Marathi Kesari. It's worth reading, even the translations are worth reading. And so, in his mind, uh, Mahabharata occurred around 1400 BCE. And he was trying to fit that in to understand the whole Orion, the Arctic home in the Vedas and so on. So, he, he obviously, he couldn't accept the 3108 BCE. So, he made some arguments. He didn't make an argument for 1400 BCE, but what he made an argument for is how 3102 BCE doesn't make sense or 2700 BCE doesn't make sense and so on. I'll quickly come to um, uh, all of you who are interested. Uh, uh, there is a one wonderful uh, researcher. Uh, he's a, a retired IPS officer from Orissa, uh, Arun Upadhyayji. Uh, and uh, Kak may, Professor Kak may know about him. Uh, so he has uh, compiled uh, 30 to 40 different uh, definitions for the Yuga from our various literatures with references. And I put that on the blog with the due credit to him. And I uh, gave a title, the naughty, like in the sense of K N A, you know, naughty, but also N A U G H T Y, the naughty problem of Yuga. And you can look at it, and they are all. Uh, conflicting, contradictory to each other. For example, there are definitions of a uh, yuga where all the four yugas in a uh, one year, all the four yugas in five years, and on and on, and goes to 24,000, 26,000, 72,000, then manvantar, multiple definitions of manvantar. So it is a very complex uh, definition issue. I mean, it's not going to something we solve easily, so do refer to that. Now, coming back quickly to Mahabharat, there is no evidence that can connect. Besides what Professor Achar said, that there are some references as to when exactly Mahabharata happened, like Antara Echaiva between Dwapara and Kali Yuga, there are nine uh, times specific word Kali is used in Mahabharata. And in all of those nine times, it is never used in the sense of the Kali Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, or Krutta Yuga that we, we talk. But in all those nine cases, it is, or at least some of the cases, it is seven times at least, it is used in the sense of the numbers that is used in the game of a dyuta. Okay, so the certain combination will be called a kruta, treta, dwapar, and uh, kali. Uh, then their Mahabharata itself has five different definitions of a yuga. And they are in my book. Uh, but the sixth definition, I mean this is a general definition, is raja kalasya karanam. And that comes multiple times and it is in Mahabharata. And what that refers to is that a king or administrator by his own or her own behavior, the way they administer, that brings a certain type of yuga. So almost king decides it. And then it gives example. I'll quickly go through a few. One is uh, Bhishmacharya. When Bhishmacharya, when Vichitravirya and Chitravirya, who is Chitravirya, they were young and Bhishmacharya was ruling uh, the whole uh, Hastinapur kingdom. Uh, the description comes that Bhishmacharya was ruling in such a way that he brought Kruta Yuga. Then in the Mahabharata, another reference comes to referring to Parshuram. 
that after Parshuram got rid of the miscreants 21 times, he established Krutta Yuga. You see that also in Ram. After Ram came back and Ram started ruling, uh, Rama's behavior, so that's a Treta Yuga, we assume. But his administration was such that he, it was also considered a, a time of Krutta Yuga. Thank you, Nilesh ji. Uh, you mentioned Professor Achar in your, uh, in your rebuttal, so I would have to ask him to address, to rebut what you just said. So if you have an opportunity, sir, if you want to. But yeah, just make it a short one minute. I'll need a five minute. Okay. 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 So uh, we are coming to approximately nearing the end of our event. Like to close by 5:45. We start 15 minutes late, so we'll stop around that time. One thing that worries me is the statement that uh, both uh, Nilesh ji said and as well as Professor Cox said that either all the data points that we have, everything is wrong, or one person is right, and Professor Kark said perhaps everybody is wrong. Now that's a dangerous place to be in my mind because this is exactly the argument the British and the others put on our texts. They said we are going to discredit the Puranas, the epics, because they are not reliable sources of history, because they couldn't reconcile some of the issues over there. So I don't think we want to assist that kind of thinking. At the same time, we need to do the diligence to make sure if we say that this is what things are, this is what it is. As an engineer, we know the value of uh, seeing what data carries what weight, is there's noise in the data, how to get the appropriate data to get the correct answer. So there's a lot over there. So what I'd like to do now towards closure of the program is to again ask the panelists, each of them, to give a five-minute closing statement on what they thought about uh, what happened to the panel and their outlook for what it is. So I'd like to start with Professor Kark, if you can, or, or, or uh, Narari sir said. Uh, I, I lost. OK, OK. So let, let's have five minutes from each on closing remarks. Just remind me if I go over. OK. <laughs> If it's interesting, perhaps I'll let you go, sir. All right. Well, <laughs> anyway, uh, otherwise, um, you know, we want to uh, move ahead. There are lots of reasons why we are where we are, but we cannot just embrace a date because we feel good about it. You know that nobody else is going to think that we are doing anything sensible by just embracing dates because they are very large, very old, and so on. So we've got to be prudent sensible. Now, just as a point of comparison, how is it that when we go to Egypt, um, they speak of different dynasties which belong to different centuries BCE? Well, about 300 BC or so, they all that they had were king lists. Just as in India, in the Puranas you have king lists. And these are the king lists that they Greek historians spoke about, which they said, go back to about 6600 BC. But what happened in Egypt was that they were able to fix a date to a certain eclipse, which was associated with one of the pharaohs in that king list. And then they said, well, this pharaoh belongs to this century BC, and now we're going to assign so many years to each pharaoh so you can go back to 1800 or 2000 BC and so on. So this is what it turned on. Now you do have these lists in India, as I pointed out, as all of us know, what is required if we wanted to do something comparable would be do due diligence so that we can find one of such events which provides an anchor to the larger chronology. But in the meanwhile, you know, you can't, there, are, there is another problem. The other problem is, well, there could be events that occurred long time ago. And they are remembered, but they were reproduced as part of texts which happened much later. And one could, people in any part of the world can remember events which are very old. For example, there is a Danish uh, epic, uh, you know, the story of Hamlet, for example. The story of Hamlet is part from a Danish epic and it goes back uh, a couple of thousand years ago but Shakespeare used that in his play. But that doesn't mean that the Danes did not in some whatever sense that they did, 
that they did not remember it even though it was not written down 2000 years ago it was a orally transmitted epic so in my view we have a lot of evidence uh let's us go back to maybe 5 6 7000 bc at the same time we have archaeological evidence which seems to be paralleling it which goes back to 7 8000 bc in the entire indus saraswati tradition and um, then we have literary you know events that we can uh, speak of um, from an astronomical basis in the various texts and we have different layers of texts so we are making progress and finally we have texts in the so called indus script and they these texts are from 3000 bc or 2500 bc now i'm i'm convinced and i've written a lot on this that the indus script is the script from which brahmi is derived that they are very very similar i did a study about 25 years ago i looked at the 10 most frequently occurring indus characters and 10 most frequently occurring uh, brahmi characters they are almost identical on the same spot in their rank order so that indicates that indeed there is a continuity so there's a lot of stuff that has emerged from archaeology and uh, the problem right now is that the indus texts are not long enough so that you can be absolutely sure that we have decoded them or deciphered them correctly but on the other hand we are uh, right now digging one of the largest indus saraswati sites namely rakhi gadhi and it's quite possible that we might come across some text which would help us break it thank you Thank you, Professor Ka. So, I'd like to request Professor Tiwari to give a closing statement. So, five minutes. Uh, we are uh, talking about Vedic chronology, especially, no, or maybe ancient Indian uh, uh, up to Ramayana and Mahabharata. So, uh, uh, my uh, submission is that uh, from known to unknown, we can, uh, we should proceed from known to unknown. and what is known first let it decide what is known to us and then we have to travel back backward so uh, in other word we can fix the lower limit and uh, upper limit will be open regarding the text everyone knows mahabharat will be the uh, one uh, when we are counting uh, from lower part will be first will be mahabharat then ramayana so i am leaving that and in the in the vedas when we go there uh, they uh, again there are six, 16 types of uh, uh, literature and their sequence is also to be fixed and in mundaka upanishad which is a really principal upanishad we find a order do vidya vedite paracha aparacha ऋग्वेदो यजुर्वेदो सांवेदो अथर्वेदो शिक्षा कल्प व्याकरण छंद निरुक्त ज्योतिष इति अपरा परायत अक्षरम अधिगम्य थे सो दे आर रिफरिंग दैट सीक्वेंस ऑफ द टेक्स्ट एंड दैट हैज टू बी फॉलोड रिगार्डिंग द वेदांगास ऑल द सिक्स वेदांगास एंड रिगार्डिंग द वेदास सो इन दैट ऑल्सो मंत्रास विल बी द फर्स्ट वेन दे वर रिवील्ड नॉलेज एज डिफरेंट ऋषिज वर दे आर दे आर इज नो पूर्वा पर वी कांट से बिकॉज सेकेंड इन सेकेंड स्टेज आफ्टर रिविलेशन ऑफ द मंत्रास इन द सेकेंड स्टेज कंपिलेशन संगीतीकरण वॉज डन संताज वर्क डन संता मीन्स कलेक्शन सो द वर्क डिफरेंट मंत्रास रिच रिच वर अलग सेपरेटली कलेक्टेड यजुश वर कलेक्टेड अथर वन कलेक्टेड सामन वर कलेक्टेड सो ऑल दिस वर्क कलेक्ट द कलेक्शन वर्क वॉज डन that is sanhita karan saniti karan and the name given to the person is vyas the same is in mahabharat also and he is also vyas that is again samhita that is sat uh, sat samhita 100000 ishtokas are there so vyas is again there so i i uh, want to say that second stage is samhiti karan and we cannot decide the date of that period also the third is the text rigved yajurved samved atharved 
when they were in this their present form only dating is to be decided about that then uh, and this and this the third state of that literature the date can be decided about that and then again i will say that only we can fix the lower limit not the upper limit again that will be the statement of mine and these questions should be solved harappan civilization dating is done 3000 bc so veda should be previous to that and because harappan civilization civilian uh, their uh, cities are there eat, uh, eat uh, ishtikas are there they are big bring uh, in vedas also th all these things are referred in shat there are so many ishtika vivranam there so the according to my submission this is the later vedic period no doubt it is the later vedic period i have given you my book rigvedic studies where i have compared the ornaments of the rigveda and the harappan civilization secondly i wrote a paper on the vastu rigvedic vastu and the harappan vastu like that we can compare and similar so shatpath brahman date is 3000 bc according to scholars so that the later period of vedas is the beginning of uh, or the extension of the harappan civilization it means max, ba, we can go back up to 3000 because we don't know when rishis were revealing those mantras but when the present form of this samiti karan was done that is before Uh, that can go up to six thousand or uh, uh, about that. So uh, this is uh, my is, and the same is with Ramayana. Three stages when Ram was there, when Ramayana was written by Valmiki, and then the present form of Ramayana was finally done. In the Mahabharata also there are three stages: Jaya, Bharata, Mahabharata. So all this is in our traditions. So I I say. when there are there are categories of evidences available literary evidences should please be given some importance and we are working on those literary evidences archaeological astronomical and other evidence nilishtik all should be if gathered then we can reach a positive conclusion and which which and always we should keep in our mind the conclusion should be according to the prestige of our country our origin our civilization not coming from outside like that things should be refuted totally refuted because if there is an option i always say to my children to my students to everyone if there is an option this or that why not to choose the thing which is of our pride which which gives the glory which gives confidence so uh, all that is my mission thank you thank you tiwari so I'd like to request nick all right so uh, just like uh, you know there are crowd sourcing i would suggest uh, maybe the time is for crowd criticism and crowd researching and that might help us you know take this uh, further quickly i will state my claims uh, for mahabharat 5561 bc for ramayan uh, 12209 bc for ram ravan yuddha that's 13 millennium bc when it comes to rugveda Uh, the let the last part which is veda vyasa recompiling recasting to 6 millennium bc and based on the saraswati evidence uh, the internal evidence textual evidence of ramayana mahabharat rigveda and then corroborating with uh, geology hydrology geophysics morphodynamics evidence of saraswati from all those the oldest mandalas and of course there is a difference the way professor achar thinks the sequence and shrikantalagiri so i have taken shrikantalagiri's uh, basic structure but i have tested it actually i am testing it right now by seven different independent ways three ways i have tested it with flying colors but i'll not go into that uh, so so that's kind of the scenario as far as i am concerned now quickly i will mention that i started with astronomy i took every single reference of astronomy i could find uh, so 200 in 2011 now they have reached to 300 plus and they will continue to grow in case of ramayan close to 600 astronomy and associated references based on that i built it but then i had a luck to corroborate it with the additional evidence from 12 plus 
other different disciplines of science and there is a poster that i placed it there but my youtube videos are out there and obviously i'll be publishing all of this into book form or some research paper form or so on so i'll ask you to look at it but 12 different disciplines of science so geology hydrology i just mentioned chronology genealogy frankly i mean you know it almost turned like a wow are you really serious or are you nuts but even i have a genetic evidence that a corroborative evidence for the timing of Mahabharat war. Vagartha Pratipattaye is the prayer of Kalidasa. So, when we interpret this, the walk, the word, and the artha should go together. Uh, in Bhishma Parva, before uh, Vyasa uh, talks to Dhritarashtra, Ihayudde Maharaja Bhavishyati Mahankshayaha Yathemani nimittani bhayaya upalakshate. I see these omens and I'm going to describe to you. Omen, by definition, is a transient phenomenon. It was not there before, it happens, and then after some time, it's not there. The omen indicates an, a disaster. The omen that uh, Oak uses is Vachaisha Vishruta Rajan Strailoke Sadhusammata Arundhati Tayapesha Vasishta Kushtatakrutaha. Arundhati was revered in all the three worlds because she was a Pativrata, she followed Vasishta. Even she left Vasishta behind. And now, he, to his credit, he finds this evidence that from 11,000 BCE, before that, Arundhati was following Vasishta. From 11,000 to 4,500, Arundhati is leading Vasishta. And he fixes the date at 5,561. Now, at 5,561, Arundhati has been leading Vasishta for 5,000 years. Can you regard that as an omen? I don't think so. Okay. And he takes liberty with finding meanings of words, makes up his own explanations, and associating and inventing astronomical phenomena. For example, Krishna leaves for peace mission on Revati Nakshatra and Kartika Masa. It is Kartika Purnima when Krishna arrives at Hastinapura and there is a lunar eclipse. Krishna and Karuna ride together on Uttara Palguni Nakshatra. Seven days from that day is going to be an Amavasya at the time of Jeshtha Nakshatra. These are the most important events in Udyoga Parva, and in fact, these four events can be used to determine the date of the Mahabharata war uniquely. Now, but for Vok, the month is not Kartika. He interprets it as month of lotuses, but yet he agrees that it's Revati Nakshatra and Uttarapalguni when the two ride together. He interprets the words Somasya Lakshma Vyavruttam as not a lunar eclipse, but appearance of a moon near a uh, uh, new moon. And in this, Saptama Chapi Divasad Amavasya Bhavishyati Sangramam Yoje Tatratam O Shakra Devatam. The Nakshatra is referred to as Shakra Devata, is the Adipati. Oak interprets that as Vishakha Nakshatra. But the Adipati for Vishakha Nakshatra is Indragni, not Indra. It's a dual Devata. You cannot separate the two devatas separately and take Indra out of Indragni. So, Shakra Devatam can only refer to Jeshtha Nakshatra and not Vishakha. So, the sequence of events according to the epic should be Revati Nakshatra, Kartika Purnima, Lunar Eclipse, Uttara Palguni, Krishna and Karna right together, Amavasya in seven days, Jeshtha Nakshatra. But O gives following sequence. It's Revati Nakshatra, Amavasya at Vishakha, Kartika Purnima, Dhritarashtra and Vyasa meeting, and then the war, and he says the war begins at on a Amavasya at Jeshtha Nakshatra. And he gives a calendar. Look at this calendar. Year 5561 CC, and he lists the Rutus, Vasanta, Grishma, Varsha, Sharad, Hemanta, and he lists the uh, equinoxes, summer, spring equinox, summer, and all that. But look at these months. He has if you look at this, Adhika Bhadrapada and Adhika Kartika. He has two Adhika Mata, Adhika Masas in that year. That makes it 14 months. And in addition to that, 
look at this bhadrapada is followed by adhika bhadrapada kartika is followed by adhika patrapada this year we had adhika masa in jeshta it's always the adhika jeshta followed by the nijaj jeshta it's completely opposite here so we cannot take this as a lender okay and a uh, few more minutes and uh, this map i don't know if you can see clearly this is the planetary positions on the date of war on uh, october 16 5561 uh, i can i will take a lot of time to go through all the details none of this fits the 20 or 27 planetary positions he describes and he gives interpretations for vakra motion uh of affliction of rohini entirely differently and so we cannot accept any of those and if i have time i can go through that but uh, 5561 bc is not the date thank you thank you thank you professor acha so just in a very quick one 30 second closing remarks uh, we have seen some excellent discussions by all the panelists and my position has been that these are all wonderful because it helps us in understanding the research because these are all our indic researchers every one of their works their methods enriches us because the methods of professor racha methods of uh, uh, professor kak of nilesh nilakant ogji and everybody that educates us of what the issues are where where how why and other things so i feel there is great value and this is how science grows this is how we make mistakes we learn and so on right now we have opinions it's very important to understand nobody here has a definitive final word these are all opinions and as professor kak also mentioned that we need to find some anchor that will help us to say yep a very definitive anchor we can do things we are not there yet so i think we should uh, uh, applaud every single researcher here who's done a tremendous service for understanding our past so let's hear it for the panelists everybody thank you